Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Struggle Creates Strength. Struggle Creates Strength is a mental health platform exemplifying that everyone has a story. I always say that no two stories are the same, but every story has the potential to help someone else. On today's episode, we are joined by 18-year-old Luke Shields. Luke has encountered some things in his life that nobody should ever have to encounter. He talks a lot in the podcast about PTSD and how it affects a family, and he also talks about how you can never burden yourself with some of the things that have happened in life. He realizes that what happens in life is going to happen and you can't control everything. He's seen some things that nobody should ever have to see and he's been through some things that nobody should ever have to be through. But he's here today speaking with courage, strength and vulnerability to hopefully help someone else. I hope everyone enjoys the podcast and I hope everyone enjoys Luke's story. Also, this podcast is sponsored by Raincoast Clothing. Raincoast Clothing is a clothing company based out of Vancouver Island, Canada. They represent nature by embracing adventure, spontaneity, and health, both physical and mental. They have recently decided to join my mental health movement and donate 5% of profits from every item of clothing towards mental health awareness. Also, we have collaborated and created a Struggle Create Strength t-shirt, which has 100% of profits going towards mental health awareness. Go to raincoastclothing.com and help support mental health while also getting yourself some great clothes. Now I hope you enjoy Luke Shield's story and just remember that everyone has a story. First and foremost, I really just want to thank you for one, reaching out to me and two, obviously coming onto the podcast, sharing your story, being vulnerable and just basically proving that it's okay to not be okay. Not a problem. Happy to help. Yeah, of course. Well, um, so in most podcasts, I kind of just jump kind of right into their story. And I don't know if you want me to start slow and we can ease into it, or if you are just ready to kind of hit it hard and share your story in in, in its full length. Um, We can just jump right in if you'd like. Absolutely. Yeah, that sounds awesome. So obviously, first and foremost, you're from Camel River and um, I know that the reason why we connected was through basically one of my other podcasts with Eric Wright and um, yeah. he talked a little bit about you and you said you talked a little bit about him as well and um, but you have a very different story and you have a story that honestly I I'm really excited for this one because I want to hear more about it and hear more about your story and just who you are so yeah just Jump right into it. <laughs> so basically, um, I grew up with a military family. My dad is a, or he was a combat engineer. He's now retired. And uh, my mom's a pharmaceutical technician. And we'd move around a lot. So I've lived in uh, quite a few places. Haven't been to the same school for more than four years. Uh, so that was kind of interesting. Um, but what I really wanted to talk about was um, how the military kind of uh, affects a family and how anyone who works in um, dangerous jobs can have an effect on their family. Mm -hmm. So uh, for instance, when I was a lot younger, my dad was constantly going away, uh, whether it was up to the Arctic or out to the Middle East, but he was gone a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, you notice these differences when you'd come back from places Um, For instance, he, for a while there, when he came back from Syria, he would have a, almost like a phobia of walking off of paved surfaces. And I later learned it's because um, at the time I was quite young and I didn't understand. But Mm -hmm. when I got older, I understood that uh, um, most of the unpaved surfaces in countries like Syria and um, Bosnia were riddled with landmines. And... um, there was a section of my dad's unit there that uh, walked through a minefield by accident and uh, it didn't land very well for his team there. And uh, I remember we were walking on a sidewalk to go get ice cream there and I was like five or six years old and it was the summer and I stepped off onto uh, off the pavement to cross on the grass or something. And he just yanked me by the back of my hood and um, like kind of cradled me in his arms and turned me away. And then he kind of like let me go and patted me on the head and said, sorry. And my mom kind of looked at him weird, but nobody really understood what was going on. Mm -hmm. Um, 
yeah so it was those kind of things that uh it's just it you could see how somebody can come back from something so dangerous without a scar on their body but nobody can see that the brain has been scarred yeah there's no like you you break a bone and you get a cast but there's no visible scars to the brain mm -hmm. it is just kind of these telltale signs mm -hmm. um so that was kind of one piece of it but uh later on um when i was about 11 years old my sister candace uh, she took her own life wow. and um, my dad found out over a phone call because at the time she was a bit older and she was living with um, their half siblings. So she was living with her biological mother, mother down here in Comox while we were living up in uh, Yellowknife. Mm -hmm. And um, he was at work at the time that we got the phone call. And I just remember sitting there and my mom sat down in the kitchen crying and I had no idea why. And then she slowly became to tell me that my uh, sister was no longer alive. And at the, I was 11. I didn't really understand what that had meant. So mm -hmm. I just kind of sat down and tried to comprehend the vastness of uh, losing a sibling. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the part that hit me more than even my sister dying was uh, the reaction of my dad. Because, of course, I'm seeing this uh, strong military figure my entire life, man who never cries, he only laughs, always is on the job, never stops. Mm -hmm. And to see him collapse into a ball of tears was something that I had never witnessed before. Mm -hmm. And, <clears throat> uh, sorry, I just walked into my bedroom and crawled underneath the bed and I sat there for, I don't know, a couple hours well, I could just hear him crying. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of odd. It was something that I had never experienced before. And like I'm saying here, with all these incidents that people experience as children, you don't understand the effect that it has on you until later in life. And it's, it's kind of heart-wrenching to see other people go through such trauma when they're younger, because none of this has happened really directly in front of me it's just all been what I've witnessed and it's still difficult to comprehend but just imagining what my dad could have gone through is uh quite difficult absolutely um yeah so there were a lot of other points that I wanted to talk on and uh, mm -hmm. a lot of them aren't as heavy or as uh um eye teary um they're a little bit more happy <laughs> so we're not gonna sit here gloomy the entire time we do this podcast <laughs> um i was uh quite avidly uh christian when i was younger and i still like to think myself as i am mm -hmm. uh, i what constantly was put in christian and catholic schools and uh i was a bit of a choir boy uh which is kind of funny because i tell that to my friends now and they look at me and they're like are you kidding me you choir boy I'm like, yeah <laughs> so it's kind of funny to tell them because they're not expecting it at all but um uh there's always something kind of uh good and um eye-opening about reading the bible from time to time and it doesn't matter really whether you believe in um, if we have a faith that's religious, whether it's uh, Allah, God, Buddhism, it doesn't really matter. It's just uh, being able to find something that you can read that helps you uh, understand your situation better. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a quote, a uh, Bible verse that I think of from time to time. It's a little bit long, so I apologize if you have to write this down somewhere. No. Uh, John 16, 32 to 33. A time has come, and in fact has come, to when you will be scattered, each to your own home. You will leave me all alone, yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have told you these things, so that through me you will have peace. And in this world you will have trouble, but take heart for I have overcome the world. Um, it's kind of long and you can take that Bible quote into very different meanings, but uh, I like to think of it as someone turning to their troubles and turning to their friends and family and saying, look, this is what's going on. 
and I've found a way to overcome it. Mm -hmm. And you're overcoming that world, whether that's that world of trouble or um, that world of pain or even just uh, challenges in your life. It could be uh, your job, your family, spouses. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really matter. Um, but uh, if someone can find something, a uh, scripture that they like to read upon, it uh, can help enlighten situations in some form. Uh, I kind of wanted to get into uh, things that people can do to cope. Um, Cause you see a lot of people nowadays and they're just turning to drugs and alcohol. And that has a completely different ruining effect on mm -hmm. families and um, just addictions in general can be quite destructive. But uh, if you're able to turn that um, kind of vice around and turn it into a hobby or something you love, a passion, whether it be um, a boyfriend or a girlfriend or uh, something that you enjoy doing, like uh, writing, it could be mountain biking, it doesn't really matter. Just as long as you find something that you're passionate about, it helps with taking that toll off. And especially if you find something creative. So um, for instance, I was with this therapy group for a while after my sister passed and they were really big on writing. And at the time I just absolutely hated writing. I despised going to English class, just absolutely right hated it. It piss off the teacher for fun. I just hated English class. And I was only 12 and I hated English class. I couldn't wait till I got to high school so I could hate it even more, right? So <laughs> Uh, I'm sitting there and they're going over like writing things down and uh, carrying a notebook with you and at the time I thought you know what this is so stupid I'm gonna go find something better to do uh, but I, I still took something away from it and I wound up I was in Victoria last summer mm -hmm. and I walked into that uh, bookstore place um, it used to be Kohl's now it's like Indigo or something yeah yeah and I was standing there looking at all these beautiful notebooks and I thought, you know what, fuck it. And I, I bought a notebook, <laughs> I bought a nice pen and I just started writing stuff down. And I, at the time it was just notes for the job I was doing down there. But then I started sitting down and I, I found a Bible and I just started reading and writing. And um, I had, just been starting to write stuff down like stuff that had been bothering me during throughout the day um, I was working uh, in a cadet camp down there in Victoria so as a staff cadet there mm -hmm. and I would just write down about like officers that were pissing me off or uh, rules that the camp had that I didn't like or um, for instance I was laughing about it earlier when I saw it in my notebook but uh I had taken, I wrote down like the day and the time and it was uh, for a briefing. And uh, then all I wrote on the page was, this is stupid, kill me now. <laughs> and I was just, <laughs> and then I just started thinking about it and I was like, wow, just writing this stuff down kind of took that burden of thinking about stuff that agitated me that got me frustrated and being able to put it on paper and you could do with whatever you want with that paper you could turn it into a paper airplane you could light it on fire you can go throw it at somebody it doesn't matter but just being able to have that freedom with uh like a, almost a physicality of your frustration was um quite nice and i uh, i think that's with a lot of things uh they, a lot of people try to confuse chaos as an opposite of like uh, peace, but it, it really isn't. Chaos can be destructive, it can be beautiful, it can be passionate. Um, you can go and you could buy a nice beautiful white canvas and all you could do is throw a bucket of paint at it and punch a hole through it and call it a day and you'll probably feel pretty good about it. Yeah. <laughs> but um it's being able to find something creative that allows you to materialize things that are bothering you that um, is really important when it comes to coping. It's just being able to take almost lifting that weight off of your brain and putting it somewhere else. Mm -hmm.
And that's really what it comes down to when it's uh, mind over body. I have a lot of points written down here, and I think I've covered almost half of them. Sorry if I talk too fast. Oh, no, it's okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm just building up questions in my head that I'm going to ask you after, so it's all good. You might want to ask some of them now because I'm about halfway yeah. done. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, just one of the one of the things that I do want to kind of touch on. Yeah, not necessarily a question, but more so just to speak on something that you said. And that is um, the fact of writing stuff down. And that's yeah. something that um, I've actually had a lot of conversations with people about it. And they mm-hmm. say it has helped them cope with so many things. And it's just allowed them to take all of their frustration, sadness, yeah. basically any emotion and just put it down onto paper. And they say that after they drop their pen, they feel 10 times better because they wrote down everything that was making them mad, sad, frustrated, whatever it may be. And they put it onto paper and they just pushed it away. It was kind of like their farewell to farewell to those emotions and they feel like they could move on or even if it doesn't help them move on right in that instant, they go back and they read it and either it makes them laugh or it makes them realize that they are okay and that they're just here again, writing something new down. And there's yeah. basically that life goes on. And I know that actually I had a conversation the other day with one of my really close friends and somebody that I never really thought would um, use this sort of coping mechanism. And he was telling me about it and he cracked me up about it though because he was just saying that (laughs) what he did was anytime that um something would get him down he'd write write it down write his thoughts write what he wish he could say to someone and then um he just leave it and he said that there's a lot of like he wasn't following some strict schedule of when he would write in his book but he would just write whenever it felt right and he was telling me that there was a couple with his coaches and he would just tell them that basically like write down that they were stupid. They didn't know what they were talking about. And, <laughs> yeah. just, and then he'd leave it for a while and he'd come back and he'd read it. And he said, so, like, usually when he would go in to write something, he was, um, he was in not a depressive state, but in a lower state. And yeah. he said, as soon as he would read something like that, it would just make him laugh. And then he said, it's basically like a bit of a, bit of a serotonin booster, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> it's just your thoughts and everything that you write down. But yeah, it's pretty funny. Uh, that was another point that I wanted to talk about was uh, the, the joy of laughter. And it, we all have heard that like overabundant saying that laughter is the best medicine. And it's, it's, it you may have heard it a thousand times but it's definitely extremely true i mean of course sitting there and laughing isn't going to heal your broken femur but um it it certainly helps with being able to deal with uh that pain of a broken femur Uh, i would never want to break my femur i've broken my shin i don't want to go any farther up the leg but uh, (laughs) it's just being able to laugh about stuff and i mean you could be so worked up over something and at the end of the day you come home you sit down And you write it down on a piece of paper and you look at it. You come back 10 minutes later with a cup of coffee, you read it again. You think, I was so worked up over nothing. That was so (laughs) stupid. (laughs) And it's just, it's so funny sometimes to to sit there and you, our minds tend to overwork up uh, our like struggles. And I'm not saying that most of our struggles aren't like important or don't matter or they're not bad i'm saying that we get frustrated over the littlest things like oh that lady didn't push her fucking shopping cart all the way in (laughs) or um this guy cut me off in line at timmy's or something right but um Mm. and we'll sit there and we'll be so turmoiled over these little things all day and at the end of the day we come back and we sit down and we reflect on the day and we go well i was really mad about that but it doesn't actually matter i mean and I, I find that people, they tend to get so worried about things that they have no control over. And they start stressing themselves out over stuff that will never be able to be affected upon. Like, uh, 
you get frustrated when you're driving, for example, and I, you can't control how that other person's driving. Uh, it you you weren't the one in the driver's seat when that dude ran that red light in front of you or cut you off in traffic, or the dude who walked in front of you at Timmy's and stole your spot because you came out of the washroom a little late. Like it. It's just, we get frustrated about things that we can't control. And when people get frustrated over things that they can't control, they just get all these bottled up emotions and it builds up and it builds up and it builds up. And then at the end of the day, we're suffering from an anxiety attack Mm -hmm. over little things that we didn't recognize weren't a big deal. It could be so simple as stubbing your toe when you get up in the morning. Go, great, I'm going to have a terrible day. (laughs) But if you stop for a second, rubbed your toe, went, that didn't hurt so bad. Now I'm just making the bed weaker. And next time I hit it, it'll break. (laughs) Now you've just completely changed your atmosphere. If you, I find that sometimes I tend to joke about stuff a little bit too much. And some people look at me and go, you shouldn't be joking about that. But then I see them later on and they're still turmoiled over whatever I made a joke about. Mm -hmm. And I'm the only one in the vehicle or in the room that is in a happier mental state. And I'm looking at them like, geez, guys, stop being so depressed. Just joke about stuff a little bit. And then maybe we could lighten the mood. And I think people have trouble with lightening the mood. I'm not saying that you shouldn't be sitting there trying to crack jokes and laugh at a funeral, but, um just on a day-to-day basis we got to try and have a more positive mental state when we go into our days Mm -hmm. absolutely and it's just having that little extra bit of laughter yeah i know that's (laughs) so funny you say that like that's one of my biggest things and one of the biggest things that i always try to do for myself and honestly for others like i think laughter obviously it helps you but it also helps others like when you I know, I know for me anyways, when I'm walking around and I see somebody happy, smiling, laughing, my first initial thought is I want to meet them. I want to know why they're laughing. And it honestly, it makes me laugh. And it just, and I, <laughs> even if I don't know them, it just makes me laugh because it's, it's contagious. You know, what was so is contagious. <laughs> yeah, it is quite contagious. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it, I that's also, exactly. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. No, that's exactly the point there. It's just if, if you're if you walk into a store with a smile on your face and now we have to wear masks everywhere. But if, if, if someone can see that you're like visibly happy, you can see your atmosphere around you kind of lift. And it, it's almost awe inspiring how easy it is to change the almost like aroma in a room with just a little bit of laughter. Like if you and your friend are sitting in the back of class at school, for example, just kicking yourselves laughing over the <laughs> stupidest shit, everyone around you starts laughing and they have no idea what the hell you're laughing about. It's great. Yeah, exactly. I know. Yeah. Well, and that's literally one of the biggest things too, is um, like we said, is laughter is not only like this big coping mechanism, not only helps other mm-hmm. people, but it also just makes you realize that life is pretty great. And mm-hmm. um, I mean, um, like life is not always great. And that's the harsh reality. No. Of it. It, yeah. Like it, it'll throw you some curveballs, 100%. But in the grand scheme of things, at the end of the day, like we have to, like I know one of the biggest things is right now, 2020, everyone has it out for 2020. And I mean, yeah, like there's been, like it's not been good. It has not been good. But with that being said, I think there's a lot of, it's kind of like a lot of self-reflection that needs to occur. And I know for myself anyways, yesterday or the day before I was driving and I was just thinking about 2020 and because I kept hearing people say, oh, 2020 is the worst. Can't wait for 2021. And then in my head, I was I was like, why? Like, yeah, yeah, we've been, we've been dealt some <laughs> shitty hands. Like we 100 yeah. percent have, but at the end of the day, like you have to also look at your life and look at how you, like what you did with it in these times. Like, yeah, for like, anyways, for myself, what I did is I decided to start a mental health platform and that's like, and then <laughs> it allows people to talk about these terrible times that we're having 
but mm-hmm. um, like ultimately we focus so much on the negatives on a daily basis. And like you said, in the lineups at Tim Hortons in, in the mall, in like driving and traffic everywhere, yeah. we always focus on the negatives rather than just kind of taking a step back, realizing that we're doing what we can and everyone has their own stuff going on. So we yeah. can't control the way that somebody drives their car. We can't control the way that somebody acts in general. And that's just like exactly. the harsh reality of it is you can't control people like robots as much as some people like to think you can, you mm-hmm. cannot, <laughs> you can just focus on yourself and the way that you take every scenario and the way that you present yourself in public. And if you have a smile on your face or if you're the one miserable Karen, if you will, at the yeah. shopping mall, right? I guess a question that I have for you, and this is coming like kind of way off, way off what we're talking about of laughter and everything like that. Yeah. But, um, I just want you to kind of touch a little bit more on the whole, uh, kind of the whole PTSD factor and what that ultimately entails like I know you you talked a little bit yeah um about it but I just kind of want to like me personally anyways I just want to know more um kind of of what that's like and especially on a day-to-day basis and if you notice it say while your dad was away or if it's strictly just when uh just when he's home uh yeah it (laughs) a lot of people confuse post-traumatic stress disorder with um something that can be diagnosed with uh, just like first responders or um, military personnel, police officers, and such like that. But in reality, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder is defined as um, any type of trauma that can cause someone to have a major effect on their change of day-to-day life. So um, a more uh, grounded example that you might not um, see is uh, for example, it could be um, a construction accident and you could have been working on a construction site and whether yourself or somebody there got seriously injured, like a uh, loss of a limb or impaled, killed, uh, guts hanging out, that sort of deal, lost an eye, a broken jaw. Um, it's just any type of um, overly extreme trauma. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it just kind of it almost has this numbing effect on the brain Um, I remember there was an incident there uh, my dad and I were driving when we were moving down here from Yellowknife uh, there was a car accident outside of Calgary and at the time it was about uh, 13 Mm -hmm. and uh, we were behind the vehicle that got in an accident and they got t-boned by a semi-truck um, the semi truck was going about 100 kilometers an hour and just absolutely obliterated this minivan. And my dad and I were the only two there. So he pulled the car over, grabbed a first aid kit, and rolled over to this vehicle. Uh, of course, the truck driver was fine because he's in a semi truck, mm-hmm. a little bit bigger than a minivan. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he goes over, and the first thing we're looking for is. Um, like uh, you do your first aid stuff. So you're checking to see if uh, there's any danger to yourself and the environment. Is the car gonna light on fire? Um, Is there glass in places and such? And it's just the hazards that you have to avoid as a, essentially a first responder. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we went over to the car and we're checking the side that got hit first. So it was the passenger side that got hit. And um, there was uh, the mother in the passenger seat and a four-year-old girl in the back seat in a booster seat Mm -hmm. and uh, we pulled the dad out of the vehicle he um, was relatively okay his head was gashed in one spot and his arm was kind of bloody from a cut but nothing major Mm -hmm. Uh, the mother on the other hand uh, compound fracture in the elbow which is where the bone comes out of the skin um and uh she was killed on impact her head had completely snapped over to the side 
and um, uh, that didn't look too appealing. Um, and the three-year-old daughter was um, unconscious and unresponsive, and she was quite uh, bloody, and she had been thrashed about. And my dad was there giving her CPR, and uh, for a moment there, she came back to life and kind of looked up at my dad and then proceeded to pass away in my dad's arms. And I just remember him curling up in a ball almost the same way he did when my sister passed away. And he just started crying and crying and crying with this, uh, the father of the four-year-old. And uh, it took another half hour for um, an ambulance and a fire truck and such to get there. Of course, this was out um, between Calgary and uh, what's that small town towards Banff. It was kind of out in the sticks a little bit. Cochrane? Yeah, Cochrane, that one. <laughs> Forget all these small town <laughs> names in Alberta. Haven't been there in a while. But um, it was just kind of uh, the first thing he did after he uh, covered up their bodies was uh, he just put me back in the car he said sit down read a book do something distract yourself don't look outside and he sat there and he was writing down notes and the first thing that I recognized that he did was he immediately went from that emotional state and he switched back into a work mode um, and that was his first layer of defense that I later recognized was he separated himself from the situation emotionally and switched over to more of a role of a first responder and that was kind of his coping mechanism and it's generalized as bottling stuff up mm -hmm. and it's it's not very healthy uh, when you bottle stuff up just imagine trying to overfill a glass bottle with a pressurized hose after a while that bottle tends to blow up and it's not very good especially if that bottle is your brain uh, so with all these incidents of trauma that I had seen my dad go through, you could, uh, there was some times where you could just see uh, like a switch flick over in his head, almost like changing the directions on a railroad track. And he just can go from a happy, loving father who's working on something. And then the next second he's sitting down staring at his hands and he doesn't know where he is, or he's waking up at 3.30 in the morning every night, tossing and turning, and the bed's completely soaked because he's sweating to death. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's, it's almost like uh, symptoms of withdrawal um, that you see in patients with like addiction. Uh, they get the, the sweats and the tremors, but um, the difference with post-traumatic stress is that you could see that they're no longer there they're back wherever they are um, thinking about that incident of trauma whether it be a car accident or um, a firefight or um, an explosion of some sort right mm -hmm. so um and uh i i had a couple times there where i had startled my dad when he was on that other side of the switch there and I, I don't blame him for anything that he did because it, it's, it's not his fault. It's not anybody's fault, but the incident of trauma. And he would like turn around and grab me by the throat or something, thinking that I'm somebody trying to come and kill him. Or um, he would uh, go hide in the garage or the shop, or he would go for a, like a 10 K run. He'd just change into clothes and just start running. And um, it's, it's, terrible to see because you you see this figure in your life that's supposed to be there for you and is supposed to be trying to raise you as a child and you're looking at them and you're going well am i am i am i supposed to be raising you it's kind of difficult to understand when you're younger right because you're sitting there and at the end of the day you're trying to help somebody who who's supposed to be helping you in a way and it it's really confusing especially when you don't have anything explained to you when you're younger mm -hmm. and uh, I think that's uh, um, it's kind of difficult to see there 
And I, I've had some times where I've tossed and turned and woke up in the middle of the night with a bad dream thinking about um, things like the car accident or when my sister died. Uh, there is another incident and I don't think it, uh, it affected me that much, but um, it was around the same time uh, before the car accident, we were, uh, I was with my friends and we were at a lake in Yellowknife there during the summer. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I thought they were just joking at the time, but my friends were poking at me going, hey, we found a body, we found a body. And I don't think they actually thought they found a body until we got some uh, um, older gentlemen to come and help us because uh, there was this babysitter frantically looking for uh, the child she was taking care of on the beach. And this older gentleman came down into the water with us and we pulled a body of a 10 year old boy out of the lake. Oh my. And uh, the entire beach just went dead silent. And you can see everybody turn and they're hiding their children. And this babysitter just broke down. I cannot imagine what she had gone through. It, like it's not even her own child but she had the responsibility of looking over this child and and then next thing you know they're gone and it's it was difficult to see and uh I'm sitting there helping this I wouldn't say he was an older gentleman he was probably we were in grade five so he was probably like a high school student mm -hmm. and we're helping him carry this body out of a lake and we're all like 12 years old or uh, 11 years old there and it was just kind of I wouldn't know how to describe it it was odd anyone who's been hunting knows that uh, uh, when you shoot a deer or um, any type of other animal when they die and you go to pick up the body it the weight doesn't feel the same when you pick up an alive human the weight's pretty centered but um, uh, it was the difference in a body when there's no life in it that was really hard for me to grasp. It's almost like the soul has left and it's just a carcass. And that's exactly what it is. But there's a differential in uh, the way the weight shifts and you see bones bend the way they're not supposed to bend. And it was like mind numbing it kind of feels like somebody's constricting your brain uh, just to like almost stare. And after that, we were all required in our school there to go see these uh, therapists. Mm -hmm. And they did it in group sessions. So I was there with the other friends who were at the beach and they were talking about everything and none of us were really listening. We we're just sitting there staring at each other, thinking about what the hell just happened because we're all young. And once again, like I said before, you just can't grasp concepts like that when you're that young. It doesn't make sense. And the only part of that entire therapy session, we were there for two bloody weeks. The only thing I remember was one quote from Charles Dickens, and it goes, no one is useless in this world who lightens the burdens of another. And that, that quote kind of ties back into that whole laughter piece that we touched on for a little bit there mm -hmm. and they they talk specifically about humor and hobbies and what I liked about the hobbies piece uh, like I said before was to find a hobby and uh, I was told to find a hobby so I went home and I was like okay well I don't really like to do anything <laughs> except sit on my ass and play video games at the time so I was like what can I do for a hobby and my dad pulled out a camera. Uh, it was an old Russian camera, I forget the make. Uh, it was a film camera. And he handed it to me and he said, I will show you how to use this. I want you to start taking pictures. That can be your hobby. And I, I finally understood why he wanted me to do that a couple, like almost two years ago. I, I looked at him and I went, I just one day when I was out there, I, I had gotten into photography quite seriously. I have mm. an expensive camera now that I still believe I can't afford properly. <laughs> and um, and uh, I, I take pictures quite regularly. Um, and 
I looked at him about two years ago and I was sitting there holding my camera in my hand and I had just taken a picture of my dad and I looked at him and I said, so this is why you wanted me to take up photography. And all he did was look at me and smile. And my realization came that with specifically with stuff like painting or videography or photography, mm-hmm. you, it's almost like writing without words. And we've all heard that saying once again, it's another one of those repetitive sayings is a picture speaks a thousand words. And that saying is incorrect because a, a, a picture speaks a, such a vast amount of words that it's diff, uh, difficult to grasp. You can look at a picture um, of almost anything and you could pull so many different words out of it you can get well over a thousand and believe me I've done that before when I was bored um, I sat there I looked at a picture and I tried to write out over a thousand words and I did I got to like 1500 and then my wrist hurt and I put down the pen and said you know what this is stupid <laughs> it's been a waste of an hour and a half but um uh with photography for me it was being able to tell a story um within a picture so i go for instance and i took this one picture of um a mountain up in strathcona park i forget which one it is and i looked at the picture and a title popped in my head for the picture and it was uh, the wisp sings to thee and uh, a wisp is something that's very small very tiny Um, You can see a wisp as like a flea or an ant. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of almost like an oxymoron or a completely adjacent word to something as monumental as a mountain, of course, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, with that, I looked at the mountains and I was just, I kind of dumbfounded because you go and you look at, something as monumental as a mountain and then you look at yourself in comparison and i'm like sitting there yeah i'm 5'10 that mountain's absolutely massive (laughs) and this mountain isn't gonna remember me in a thousand years i'll be dead that mountain will still be there and it will not remember me Mm -hmm. and it's it doesn't remember me not because it doesn't have a brain It's because that in terms of the world, my problems are so monumentally small in comparison to something like a mountain. Now there's thousands of mountains on this planet, but even the smallest mountain is still bigger than a human. And there was a photographer and he specifically took landscape pictures. I forget his name but his entire purpose of his landscape pictures was to tell a story about humanity without using a word. And that was what kind of inspired a lot of my pictures of mountains. So uh, what I had written about the mountain here was um, the stark contrast gifted to each crest in the rocks is powerful and mood setting. While being so calm and peaceful, there's always a hidden tone of mystery and violence that lies in the mountains. The unforgiving terrain speaks to that. King Karma, uh, these are spiritual or theoretical roles, plays its role hand in hand with Mother Nature. Together they test the bounds of any who wander her peaks. Mother Nature provides the challenge and King Karma provides the consequence to the destined traveler. In time, these monolithic statues provided to us by Mother Nature will be all that is left of us, scraping the clouds as the world around them perishes and rebuilds again and again, timeless. It was a spur of the moment kind of writing thing. I was looking at the picture and I just kind of mindlessly typed that out at two in the morning and forgot about it. And uh, the next morning I, I reflected upon what I had written and I read over it again and I just was thinking about how everything in the world is here for a reason. That tree is there to be a home to um, an ecosystem. This mountain is here um, to block the wind 
or um, to divert that river. The lakes are here for water and everything has its purpose. Mm -hmm. And when thinking about things like depression or um, suicide, drug addiction, abuse, I, I like to tell people that I, I see, especially friends and family, that I see are having a troubled time is, like, is to say, um, I want you to find someone you hate with a dear passion. And I, your goal right now is to, without hurting that person in any way, shape or form, I want you to outlive them. And it's just a bit of a, a, a motivational piece to kind of uh, find a reason to live. And it, if it, it sounds quite bad, but um, it's easier to find something uh, that you can agree upon with other people when you hate something equally. Mm -hmm. Um, so if, if you both like, if you both hate tomatoes, uh, <laughs> you'll probably get along pretty well. You sit there and you're going and you're ordering food with your friend. You know, yeah, can I get uh, this burger without tomato? And your friend looks at you and gets so happy because he also hates tomato. <laughs> and you find something in common. <laughs> and it, it's kind of an us versus them mentality, but it, it's just being able to find things um, that other people um, dislike or like and if you're able to relate with them a little bit it's uh, it's really helpful in building those relationships mm -hmm. uh, I've been rambling here a little bit do you have any questions oh, okay <laughs> no I just on that last one I just want to say it's just so true with um, building connections and how you it's funny because I know with me, with some of the friends that I have, and um, I mean, I have some friends that are kind of polar opposite of me and have different um, opinions and outlooks on life. But I also have some friends that it's like the exact same and we like all the same stuff. <laughs> we follow the same paths. Um, but yeah. it's really interesting to one, hear you say that, but two, just to see how, um, how you actually build connections over mm -hmm. periods of time. And when you meet new people, like for instance, <laughs> with some of your best friends, they were not always your best friend. You didn't meet no. them one day and go, yeah, you're my best friend. We're going to do everything together. Cause that's not how it happens. It happens over time. And yeah. reverting back to that, it happens through learning more about someone and building connections and maybe over a hatred of tomatoes you never know <laughs> yeah it could be something as simple as that yeah and uh that was one of my last points here was um uh the roles that friends play mm -hmm. and um you don't have to have 50 friends or even 20 friends you could have like two or three really good friends and you can see them every day you can annoy the hell out of each other and at the end of the day, you look at each other and go, fuck you and see you tomorrow. And <laughs> it, it's just, it's really nice to be able to have those kinds of friendships because uh, you you can go to some of your friends there and you could talk about anything. Uh, you, you can talk about um, depression, anxiety. You can talk about drug abuse. You can talk about uh, how your mother won't get off your case about the stupidest shit you could talk about anything and it just it's almost like writing stuff down except when you're able to say it to another person um and just they don't even have to say anything back just having them be able to sit there and listen to what you are saying and what you're going through and just kind of nodding their head and agreeing with you going yeah, like yeah that's like stupid i agree with you it, um or that sounds pretty shitty why don't we go get ice cream and go throw like rocks in the river or something right mm -hmm. but um <laughs> it's it's just being able to have someone that you can go up to when you're at your lowest and just be able to give them a hug and say look i just need someone to sit here with me while I ball my eyes out or I go through a tub of ice cream or I sit here and get all frustrated and dig my fingernails into my hands. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's, 
almost as relieving as writing stuff down. And I almost can't stress it enough how important it is to be writing stuff down. Um, I leave my notebook beside my bed. It's in my camera bag and my camera bag never leaves me now. Um, and I just write stuff down. Uh, it could be a quote that I see or um, a Bible verse that I've read. It could just be a note about, um, let me find something stupid in here. <laughs> oh, uh, something from last summer. Uh, flag party dressing. Uh, they need to call commands better. The commander's stupid uh, and they need to iron their pants. Like just the stupidest stuff, right? And <laughs> it doesn't really matter what you're writing about. And I know I've said this over and over again now, but uh, it's it's just being able to get it off of your chest, get it off of your shoulders, be able to take that note out of your brain and just throw it in a theoretical trash can and kick it to the curb. Absolutely. Yeah, I know. Yeah. That, that's one of the things that I honestly, like I personally struggle with that is um, one just, well, like I talked about before, I just don't write things down. And it's something that I know that I have to do and I really should do because uh, I know that it's beneficial. And I know like every person I've talked to about it has nothing but good things to say about it. Yeah. Um, and it's something that I'm starting to realize a lot more and I'm kind of, not that I need to build up courage to do it, but I'm starting to really look at it and think about how positive it can be and what mm -hmm. it can potentially help me overcome in, in the years to follow. But yeah. Um, yeah, another, like another little thing was, um, I would just say like with any time that you're struggling with mental health um, and you want to speak up about it and you want to share it, mm -hmm. you need to, like you said, it doesn't matter if you have 50 friends, a hundred friends or two friends, like two friends is sometimes better because you feel so like two good friends though, like two friends that you know you can say anything because if you have those, yeah. if you have that group of friends or that couple of friends that you can really just be open with, share anything, cry on their shoulder, mm -hmm. uh, just allow, basically just allow yourself to be who you really are then that's most important. Like having, like you talked about this, but having those close people and just having people in general that you can take your problems to and they will listen, they will confide in you and they will just support you through everything that you're encountering. And it's, it is tough to find all the time and yeah. you're not going to have it all the time. But when you do, it's, definitely something to hold on to and, and make sure that you're not only speaking and sharing all of your problems, but you listen as well. And yeah, but mm -hmm. just to touch on obviously what you said, it's very important. And I, yeah, I just, I like what you said. Yeah. About it. I only have really one point here and it's uh, kind of fast. It's the only one I have left and it's uh, finding love in humanity. And it, it sounds kind of odd. And you're like, why the hell would I love humanity? The rest of these filthy humans are so stupid. <laughs> but um, uh, what, what I really mean is it's, it's more of a trust thing. Uh, what I like to do from time to time when I'm in a busier area, if I'm visiting down in Victoria or something or in a bigger city, I like to go to a park with my camera and sit down and just kind of watch people. Now that sounds super <laughs> creepy, but I'm not like not staring at one particular person and following them home. No, I like sitting down on a park bench and, and uh, just <laughs> observing other people uh, because you can tell by the way some people walk or um, how they interact with the other people they're with or the facial expressions that they're making, whether they have their headphones on or just one in, whether they're on the phone or not, you can get a little glimpse of what these people's lives are kind of like. And it, it's not like 
you want to know where they're going for lunch. It's just kind of, you want to know what they're feeling. And you could tell when somebody's agitated or frustrated, when somebody's happy, when somebody's just out in the park going for a run because they've worked it into their routine and they hate themselves for it, but, uh, and they hate running, but they're just out there doing it anyway. And uh, when you start to look at other people, you start to see sometimes the problems or uh, you get a sense of uh, that they could be going through stuff that they have their own problems that each individual human um, has their own trauma has their own uh, story to tell Mm -hmm. and it's it's just kind of um, like I said a love that you could find in the rest of these humans and it's quite humanizing i'm saying the word human a lot (laughs) um but uh um there was a great project and i know a lot of people have heard about it and it's called uh the humans of new york and it's a photographer and he goes around and he asks people if he could take a picture of them Mm -hmm. and he takes their picture and then he just asks them their story and they sit down and they talk about things and every single story is unique whether the person's uh family member has just passed away or they just won the lottery or um like between posts there's such a um a big switch in emotion and mood Mm -hmm. and like uh only about a third of them are sad but um the rest of them are lovely actually is the only word i could think of and you could just see that you hear these people's stories and you, you sit back and you look at the world, you go look at the landscape, you look at the mountains, you look at the ocean, you look at the cityscapes and the buildings, the cars going by, the birds in the sky, and you say, it's really not all that bad. Mm-hmm. It, it could be worse. That building could be on fire. The birds could be dead on the ground. The water could be up to the road yeah. and the mountain could be crumbling down into the lake the forest could be on fire but it's not Mm -hmm. and it's just being able to recognize that the little things that bother you like I said before the guy cutting you off and Timmy's is is it's not the end of the world and everyone experiences these little frustrations in life it's all gonna be okay in the end Mm -hmm. at the end of the day you're gonna get to the end of the road and you're gonna look back and go I had a great time there were some ups and downs. I hit some speed bumps pretty hard. I broke the front bender on my car that I call life, but it's okay. It's, it's all okay. And it's been a rough road, but I learned a lot of lessons. I've been able to pass on a lot of knowledge. And I, I believe truly that at the end of everybody's life, they're able to look back and say, I'm no longer afraid of death. Mm-hmm. And I've had a good life. It's been a good run it's nothing that they, anyone should be afraid of. And um, there was this uh, thing that I started thinking about and I, I kind of turned it into something that I like to do from time to time. And it's, I want you to think of a past version of yourself, whether it's you last October or you two weeks ago or 10 year old you and picture yourself back then in that mindset and look at modern you. Would past you be proud of you? Would they be happy for you? And most of the time, a lot of people recognize when they do that, the amount of growth that they've had in that amount of time, how far they've come. Okay, yeah, sure, you broke up with your girlfriend. Um, Your dog got hit by a car, but he had surgery, he's okay. Um, But uh, since then, I've gotten healthier of eating better I found a better group of friends and you really recognize that growth that you've had in that period of time and I I like to sit down when I'm frustrated from time to time and go wow 10 year old me would look at me and go well you're doing all right it's you're not doing too shabby so (laughs) it's just kind of it's another piece of that reflection you could sit there and uh, write about it or you could just talk about it to yourself or just even sit there and think about it but if uh, it's just that reflection that uh, I find helps so many people 
you just talking there, I, I totally lost myself in my own thoughts. I, you, yeah, I just, I took myself back to a, back to a place in the past and just fully reflected on where I was then and where I'm at now and what I've kind of overcome and that like for me anyways I reflected yeah. back a year from now or a year a year ago and yeah it's it's crazy and that's I think that's so beneficial and just your yeah. whole outlook on not only this but just life in general like I mean you've been through hell like you actually have like you've seen some shit <laughs> like you have I don't like to think so because there's always somebody who's seen it much worse and I mean, we all wind up seeing stuff that's bad and traumatizing, but at the end of the day, you just look at it and go, well, whether I was in that vehicle or not, it would have happened. That car accident would have happened. That boy would have drowned in the lake. And it was just a matter of whether or not you were going to be there to experience it. And you, you can't blame yourself and you got to try and avoid that, like almost survivor's guilt, because everything that is going to happen is going to happen. And that's been said over and over again. And there's discrepancies as to whether or not that's true and probability, yada, yada. I hate math. So we're going to avoid that completely. <laughs> it, it's just a matter of understanding. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, yeah. So going back just a tiny bit, what, what does one year ago you think of yourself now? Ultimately, I would say that I'm, I'm proud of where I'm at now, 100% from where I was a year ago. Like, I think there's always things you can improve and always of course. steps that you can take to better yourself and um, just things that you need to learn. And like, there's still so <laughs> many things that I need to learn about myself and need to learn moving forward but ultimately i think the biggest thing that i would say is um i've experienced what real growth is and by that yeah. i'm meaning like i've i've taken steps in my life that i never thought i not that i never thought i would take them but i never really had the courage to take and yeah I, have and I've experienced it and I've done exactly what I wanted to do and now I'm sitting here and I'm yeah I still have things that bother me on a regular basis but at the end of the day I look at it and I'm like wow it's crazy to think that a year ago I was dreaming of doing stuff uh, or doing some stuff and I've actually followed through and done all of that stuff and now yeah. I am here to tell the tale of everything. And I have a million new stories that I can share mm -hmm. because of the experiences that I, that I had by just taking a step and doing what I actually wanted to do. And going back to that, re reflecting on a past version of yourself, um, a year ago, I was like, damn, I really want to go skydiving. And I, I finally went skydiving this October. That's and awesome. it's just those like simple, exhilarating experiences that um, just kind of make everything makes everything feel a lot better you go and you, you're sitting there and you're you're 12 year old you and you go damn I really wish I could just go hunting whenever I wanted and now I can just go grab my gun and go hunting and or it's it's just the simple things that you grow upon it doesn't even have to be anything massive like you don't you don't have to sit there and go Next year uh, from now, I want a million dollars in the bank and I want to be jacked. It doesn't have to be that extreme. It, it just has to be something simple. Like, um, I, I want to have a better state of mind and I want to find a group of friends that I really enjoy being around, that I, I truly love and I could call them family. It just simple stuff like that. I want to see myself in a better place. Um, I want to go on a vacation to the Bahamas and just being able to goal set and then uh, go uh, a year from now and say, okay, have I accomplished any of those goals? Uh, does it actually matter if I accomplish any of those goals? And did I have fun along the way? Did it make me laugh? Um, has it bettered me mentally, physically? Um, 
and spiritually. And it's just like I've said a hundred times now that uh, reflection piece. So, yeah, I, I think, I think that's something that everyone can easily benefit from is just mm-hmm. using that state of reflection, but also, like you said, setting goals and it doesn't have to be this crazy, massive, big goal to be the richest person in the world next year. It can be something so simple and something so small. And I know, especially for myself, um, that's all that I'm trying to do now is I'm setting these little goals and I, I'm just, again, reflecting so much on my life, but also thinking about where, or kind of what I want my life to look like and Mm -hmm. realizing that the only way it's going to be exactly what I want it to be is if I make that happen and I set goals to make that happen. And I change up my average everyday life to make it happen. And that's one Mm -hmm. thing is um, I, a lot of people talk about routines and I don't know if you're a follower of routines, but um, for myself, I, back in, I don't know when it was, I think it was maybe in the summertime, I, I set myself on this super strict routine and I would follow it to a T every single day. And yeah, I felt good. But at the same time, I almost felt like I was a robot. Like I hate, like mm-hmm. I'm just the most adventurous, sporadic person that will say yes to anything. You, you name it. You're like, yeah, let's go move to Bali for six months and say let's move let's leave in two weeks I would be like the first one on board because I'm I know that that would be like the coolest experience and something that would ultimately make me really happy and if it's not a thing that I say it's not like what I absolutely love while I'm there it's not the end of the world like at least I tried it and that's like the, the biggest thing and what you said is at the end of the day, you want to be able to like, look back on your life and just say, like, be okay with dying. Like you're, you Mm -hmm. know that you've lived and that's my, like, that's exactly what I follow now is just knowing that I've lived and I never took a day or even like, especially longer than a day for granted, because Mm -hmm. once you start doing that and that's why I, I kind of shifted off the whole routine thing. And now I just kind of go with the flow because when I was on this strict routine, I kept noticing that I was pushing aside the things that I actually wanted to do. And I wasn't being who I am. Like I'm, Mm -hmm. I'm not the same as all my friends and I'm not the same as my parents. I'm not the same as like anyone else. Like I'm me and I like to follow exactly what I want to follow. Like I want to, go out until 4 a.m and just drive around and hang out with my buddies yeah and not everyone's like that like some but and then even myself like I I don't always do that sort of thing and honestly I haven't done anything like that in a while usually I'm up at 4 a.m now but um, (laughs) no like I just I love switching things up and always doing something Mm -hmm. different because I think it it's good one of the biggest things is it's good to scare yourself and doing stepping outside of your comfort zone is so big. And it's also good just to, just to be different and know that you're different and know that you're, you're just doing what you want to do. And exactly. Sometimes you, you try something that you think you love and you want to do it forever and you try it out and you hate it. And that's just that's (laughs) life. And that just, allows you to move forward and at least you can say you know what I tried it and it wasn't for me but yeah I just (laughs) ranted on there for for a little while but um, you you talked about routine there and I just wanted to throw something in about routine and uh it you don't have to have like a rigorous routine in fact you don't have to have a routine at all but uh those mindless tasks that we do throughout the day like getting out of bed taking a shower brushing your teeth Mm-hmm. if uh if if we were to just if you wanted to i'm not saying you have to but if you want to try and incorporate uh at the end of your day when you're done brushing your teeth or your nightly shower or whatever the hell you're doing 
uh, right before you go to bed, just take half a page in a notebook and write down um, things in your day that made you laugh or made you happy. And then you go back and you look at all the, the small inconveniences and the frustrations throughout your day. And you sit there and you hold them basically in one hand and you hold your notebook with everything good in the other hand. And you can just crumple up that bullshit in your other hand and toss it away because now you have a notebook full of things that made you happy throughout the day, whether it was um, something funny you saw on like Instagram or your friend said something funny and you two were just dying laughing for 15 minutes or um, just the smallest stuff. And this is I'm looping back again now, but. Uh, just being able to write stuff down that makes you happy or lifts that burden off of you. It's quite good. And I would recommend leaving a notebook and a pen beside your bed at night because we all wake up sometimes in the night and go, damn. And you think about something and it, it's just something like inspiring or cool or an idea. And then you forget it by the time you wake up uh, when you're supposed to, not in the middle of the night. But if you, if you wake up and you write that stuff down and then you go and you look at it the next day and you go, that's a good idea, like uh, an idea for a project or um, uh, something that came to you in a dream mm -hmm. and just being able to write it down before you uh, consciously forget about it, it's, um, it kind of helps with expanding an understanding of what's going on in your life. Mm -hmm. And being able to find out what those dreams mean or um, why the hell you were thinking about dinosaurs and tacos in the middle of the night or something <laughs> random. It's just it just anything that can put a smile on your face or um, intrigue you to learn something new mm -hmm. is uh, a healthy way to uh, go about your life. And I, I think it's important that I'm stressing it again. Uh, to write stuff down so if somebody does want to kind of pick your brain about all these topics that you touched on yeah. and wants to ultimately just have a form of vulnerable conversation or mm -hmm. even just reach out to you like where where could they find you um they can uh contact me on um probably the best way to get in contact with me would be through uh my photography account on instagram uh at photos underscore from dot luke that was kind of random to say but i'll send you a text <laughs> and uh, you can throw it in the description there or whatnot For sure. um or they could even email me or call me once they find that page because uh my info's on there um and one one last little thing because i know you touched a lot on tips of advice uh, for people struggling with mental health, which was awesome. And I know that I have actually used a lot of the ones that you said, but, um, and you've actually taught, you've said a couple little quotes, but did you have one that ultimately has um, kind of fixated your life in some form? Yeah, it was um, that long Bible quote yeah. at the beginning there. Yeah. Um, uh, John 16, 32 dash 33. Uh, would you like me to read it again? Absolutely. Yeah. It's super captivating and I'd love to hear it again. A time has come and in fact has come to when you will be scattered each to your own home. You will leave me all alone. Yet I am not alone for the father is with me. I have told you these things so that through me, you will have peace in this world. You will have trouble, but take heart for I have overcome the world. That itself just kind of speaks on, like for me anyways, and from this podcast, I think that just speaks of you and just everything that you're about and how you, how you take life. And yeah, I don't know. You've, this podcast has definitely moved me and it's made me think, uh, it's made me think a lot about myself and just about, my past and my like again just the one of reflecting back uh that was one that definitely hit home and just mm -hmm. hearing some of the stuff that you've encountered in your life and just the way that you've actually taken those and the just how positive you are and how you how you harp 
heart to make sure that everyone smiles and make sure that you're smiling and just realizing that you can't control what happens in the world, but you can mm -hmm. control how you take the world, which is awesome. And yeah, you just being on the podcast today is was super beneficial and I know it's going to help a lot of people. So thank you. I hope it does. <laughs> thank you for coming on. It was, it was awesome. Thank you for having me. And I, I really enjoy your project here and I, uh, I hope that it reaches a, a wide audience because it's, it's definitely a very important topic. Um, and I, I'm, I'm grateful that you uh, have put this together. Thank you very much. Yeah. And we'll, we'll definitely keep in contact. We'll talk really soon. And I, yeah, I, and if I'm ever on the Island or ever in Kelowna, we'll definitely be sure to sure to connect and meet up and, I'll show you, I'll show you my, I'll show you my, my notebook of all the things that I've written down from since today. <laughs> <laughs> I would show you mine, but my handwriting's kind of shit. So <laughs> I'll just read it to you. <laughs> <laughs> Even better. All right. Okay. It was awesome. It was awesome meeting you and really nice talking to you and having you on the podcast. So thank you once again. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to another episode of Struggle Creates Strength. I hope everyone enjoyed Luke's story and I encourage you to reach out to him and have some vulnerable conversations with him. If you want to reach me or come on the podcast, you're more than welcome to at Struggle Create Strength on both Instagram and Facebook, or you can also reach me on my website at strugglecreatestrength.com. All podcasts are posted on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, Facebook, and personal posts are posted on Instagram as well. Be sure to follow all accounts and subscribe to all channels to be notified when new podcasts are up. Thank you so much for listening, and just remember that everyone has a story.